All right, so we'll go ahead and start for today. Allow me to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Allow me to introduce our guest speaker. This is Dr. Dan Negroot. He comes to us from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he's been a professor since 2005, technically. Uh, uh, he did his PhD at the University of Iowa. Right. Yep. And he's going to talk to us today about his, his simulation work and, and some of the things he's been doing for the last 13-ish uh, years. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Okay. Negroot. David, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you to all of you for attending this talk. I don't know, probably, is it mandatory? They have to? If they're in the class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well that's extra credit freshman. Okay, nonetheless, thanks for being here. Um, so, I want to start my talk, which is primarily on computer modeling simulation by giving credit where it's due. Um, I, I, I'm a professor in the University of Wisconsin Medicine. Um, I am, um, probably you're wondering why the accent. Uh, that's how people talk in medicine. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, I'm from Romania, and uh, my English was actually perfect. And then I went for my PhD at the University of Iowa, and I picked up this accent. <laughs> no, I'm kidding again. So, okay. Um, in Romania, I don't know how many of you know what Romania is, uh, but probably you have heard of Transylvania. Have you heard of that place, Transylvania? I'm from there. And uh, I, I survived. And it, it actually, it's very peaceful. Uh, anyway. So let me tell you a couple of things about the lab. There are like a bunch of people in the lab. Uh, there's a scientist, Radu, right here at the top. And there are six graduate students, and here they are. Uh, we operate in the lab, one of the largest supercomputers at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And Colin here is the person looking after the, the supercomputer. And there are some undergrads. Actually, there are way more than this. But uh, I just, this is kind of like an old slide. Uh, a lot of people who, undergraduate students who just come to the lab to learn like, hey, is this something that I might be interested in or not? And then probably some of them stick for like three, four, five months and then they leave. Some of them just stay with us. And actually that's the best pipeline to recruit people. I also want to give credit to, to other people. Um, these are the cool guys. They're from Italy. Probably you can look, look at these guys. You know, they are like, <laughs> like, like the cool guys with the shades and such. Uh, and actually, we're working on a software infrastructure. I, in the lab, we develop software. And software that is supposed to help engineers do certain, you know, studies, inquiries, analysis, and such. And such. But the software infrastructure that we developed was started by actually this guy in 1998 as part of his master's thesis at the University of at Politecnico di Milano in Italy. And in 2007, <coughs> so like 12 years ago, I started to work with him. And then we've been working together uh, since then. Um, I also want to acknowledge some funding sources, from mostly from the Army, some of it from the, the NSF. Uh, also, I honestly, I didn't know who I was going to talk with today. I didn't know that it was a group of students. But anyway, the slant of this talk is not going to be a whole lot of research gore and equations. You know, I have to put some equations in there because otherwise I would, I would have a crisis of, you know, identity. Who am I and why am I doing this? So I have to put some equations there. But by and large, it's going to be kind of like, you know, we're going to, to talk a little bit about friction and contact and then a little bit about fluid dynamics and a little bit about uh, validation if I don't write out the time. So where do I operate? I operate at the overlap of engineering. Because I'm looking at engineering problems, and my background, my degrees are in mechanical engineering. But nowadays, the courses that I teach are, by and large, kind of like computer science in nature. Uh, for instance, this semester, I teach a course on high-performance computing. And there are 78 people uh, from nine departments. <coughs> and uh, I, I'm more and more moving into, into that direction. I also, when I have an engineering problem, usually you look at it and you formulate some equations. Uh, that basically, if you solve, tell you something about the nature of the problem that you are looking at. Well, by and large, these equations, there are many of them. In some cases, like billions of them. And you cannot solve them pen and paper. So, you know, I look at numerical methods to solve this large number of equations, and I need computers to do that. So the work I'm doing is the overlap of mechanical engineering and applied math and uh, computer, computer science. Um, so, 
what do I actually do? What I do, when people ask me, you know, what business I am uh, in, I just see that I'm in computational dynamics. Dynamics, you probably know what it is, but how things move, and I imagine that everybody has to take a dynamics class. And you have these questions like, if you push this thing in a certain way, how is, how is it moving? You have friction, and it impacts something, and you have gears. So I'm, those are, by and large, you know, the, the dynamics problems that I'm looking at. I told you that they have a computational slant because usually you cannot solve them pen and paper and use computers to, to find the time evolution of these dynamic systems that, that you're interested in. So here are some example applications. These are <coughs> mechanical systems that I'm interested in how they move and how they change in time. Um, I have some funding from Caterpillar. Uh, uh, I'm interested in, in rover mobility. Last year, we, we finished a project with JPL, with NASA down in Pasadena. And the, the idea of that project is uh, they want to send rovers to all sorts of places. The one that we're looking at uh, was tied to a moon of Jupiter called uh, Europa. Uh, and just as an interesting thing that I'm going to come back to that, the gravitational acceleration there is 1.3 rather than 9.8. So everything is lighter, things move differently. And they cannot take a rover, go there, test it, come back, change it, go back, test it again. So they have to kind of like, you know, have imagery from there. They know some properties about the planet. And they do their best through modeling and simulation to understand how a vehicle would move on that planet. Um, I'm also interested in this. I'm not going to talk a, little, a whole lot about this today, but I'm interested in like extreme events such as rover, autonomous vehicles moving around and talking to each other. If I come back next year, I'll talk about that, okay? So that's, you know, something that is like interesting, but what uh, pays us in the lab is this type of applications. Uh, a lot of money comes from the Army. They're interested, for instance, in like, hey, can we look at how a vehicle engages in a fording operation? Or can you tell us how much we should deflate our tires, lower the pressure so that we have better grip on sand and move faster? That kind of stuff. Um, and to that end, what we're doing in the lab is kind of like the intersection of several fields of physics. So we call it multi-physics because it looks at the motion of fluid, so the motion of granular material, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, so what I do, in a nutshell, goes back to this guy. Uh, he came up with the, this equation, F equals M times A. 300 years later, I still struggle with this equation to solve them and uh, you know how to do it efficiently and as accurately as possible. The thing is that, you know, it might seem simple, but if you put it in the, in, in the context of a real-world application, you have, for instance, like this, just bulldozer pushing a boulder. And if you think about it, you just do like a three-body diagram, uh, look at forces. So you have a force, somebody pushes this, and then they have like a normal force, and they have a friction force, and then you have some weight, okay? And you have some mass and some mass moment of inertia. Well, in general, in general, for like real-life applications, you do not quite know what the friction force is. And I'll come back to the next slide. All you know, for instance, if you embrace the Coulomb friction model, which that in itself is a you know, question if you want to do that or not. But then you kind of like need to know this N, uh, which is not always obvious what it is. And then you have to come up with the friction force, which again is not quite obvious what it is, except that whenever you know, you come up with it, at the end of the day, it should be less than or equal to mu times N, right? That I, I hope that, you know, we're speaking the same language or on the same page here. So if you know N and if you know the friction force, then you just write mass times acceleration equals force. So if I know all these guys, then I can find out what the acceleration is. And I do some time integration, I, I find the velocity, and I do some more time integration, I get the position, and I find out how this body moves, that rock, you know, as it gets pushed. So if you want to, you know, just make it more, drill a little bit on this concept of friction force, the interesting thing about this friction force is that it's not, it's tricky in the sense that it's not a value per se. The friction force can be many values. So for instance, you have this brick, and if I pull this brick, and I have a friction coefficient of 0 0.1, and the, the weight is 1 in Newton. So if I pull with 2 Newton, the friction force is going to be 2 Newton. If I pull by 5 Newton, the friction force is going to be 5 Newton, just, you know, 
uh, to spite me. Hey, if I, if I pull with 20 Newton, then the friction force is going to be 10 Newton and it saturates at that. So that's why, you know, people say that is not a value, the friction force is a set value function because it can be in a set and that set is F friction force less than mu times n. So any value less than mu times n is fair game. But I don't know which value it takes and I have to compute it. So if I have something like this, it's fairly easy to compute it, okay? It's one, 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 one body. But the more interesting thing is we have something like this, you know? If you have like basically lots of them and you have like millions of these frictional contact events and I have to figure out for every single one what the friction force is and what the normal force is because I don't know. I have to have a model and predict them and compute them. So that's why computing is important because you don't want to do this pen and paper as you can see on this page. Now another thing that is interesting on this slide is that, you know, this is reality. This is what we do right now. And, and it's pretty obvious that, you know, this is way smaller than this. And I'll come back to this, but the, the idea is that uh, in one cubic meter of sand, you have anywhere between like one to two billion elements. So therefore, you have probably like something like four billion frictional contact events that you have to figure out and understand what the friction force is and what the normal force is, then just keep advancing the simulation in time. So there are two things that are tricky here. I call them thing one and thing two, if you go back and I don't know if you read that book, uh, Dr. Seuss. So there were like two tricky things. One is the normal force and you have to come up with a model for that to be able to compute it. And then thing two is once you have a normal force, you also have to compute the friction force with an understanding that the friction force should be less than or equal to mu times n. So there are many models. I'm going to just talk for like 30 seconds about one that is probably the most common one. And why do I think that is common, the most common one? Because that paper that introduces the model has 13,000 other papers referencing it. So a lot of people use this model. And I'm not going to get into the details, but I'll just tell you this. Imagine that you have like two spheres and you, 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 you press them against each other. And if you assume these, again, to be spheres, they are going to overlap a little bit. You can think about it as they either deform or they overlap if they don't change shape, right? But you agree in your model to compute the normal force as some stiffness k times that overlap, okay? So they, if k is large, they cannot overlap too much because there's a force that is going to basically send them apart. So that's basically the idea of this. And, you know, some people take this they, they just took the idea and just put it on steroids and they say like, hey, look, it's not only the overlap, but it's also proportional to the speed at which the overlap increases. So more like a damping time term. And then all sorts of variations, but the theme is the same. They, they overlap a little, a little bit or they form a little bit, then there's a force that immediately keeps them apart. So that's the gist of it. And then once you have the normal force, you have thing one, you need to compute thing two, which is the friction force. And that, again, you know, there are other models that, that are basically kind of like originating from the same paper, but you have like a small creep mechanism that, that creeps in, and you have like this friction that prevents the relative motion of the two bodies. So I'm not going to get into the math, but whatever, you know, friction force you come up with, the tangential component, the friction force should be less than or equal to mu times the normal component. And there are like certain expressions that give you this, this friction tangential force. So going back to the problem of interest, when we look at the when we looked last year the, 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 the rover, by the way, the rover was like what is called the this robo simian uh, uh, robot. And this to prevent it from getting stuck, it rolls, but then if it I don't know if you go back long enough to remember probably like two thousand probably like 2006 or something like that, there was a Mars rover that got stuck. So that was like hundreds of millions of dollars that basically went down the drain. But that, still, it was not as bad. I don't know if you go back that, that long. There was another one that, that burned into the atmosphere of Mars because some people in Colorado were using inches and some people in California were using, were using centimeters and they like basically disintegrated the, 
<laughs> before it landed. But that's a different story for a different day. So two years from now, if I come, I'll, try, I'll tell you about that. But now you have this situation where if you don't want it to get stuck, then what happens, the wheels lock, and this thing starts walking like a dog. And if it starts sinking, then it lifts its legs and it starts moving on its belly. And I have some movies of this. Uh, I don't have them in this presentation, but I understand that, that we're going to talk a little bit about this. So if you want, I can show you those movies later. Um, but anyway, the point here is that you have something like this, and this is a JPL, most likely. Um, um, they cannot do this on Titan or on, on the moons of, 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 of uh, Mars. So they have to do modeling and simulation. Now they have one billion or 1,000 million bodies, which means probably ballpark four to five billion frictional contact events, and they have to simulate something like that. Um, so this is what you are faced with, to deal with something like this. Um, and this is what people call like a multi-scale problem, because on one hand, you have the vehicle, the vehicle moves over, let's say, 10 meters in probably like 10 minutes or something like that, even even longer than that, so meters on one hand, but then you have these particles, and the size of the particles is 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 3 meters, so it's like millimeter. So you have, you're looking at something like large, moving on something that is, <coughs> that is, that is small. So here, you imagine that you have like sand, and sand, you have like the first, the very first layer of sand, like a superficial layer. So you just visualize this. You have some particles that sit on top of some other particles. And those particles sit on top of other particles. And you have like layers upon layer upon layer, OK? But imagine on the very first layer. So if you have this force model, the contact model, it, in which you look at the deformation of a body to produce a normal force, then imagine what deformation will the very first layer of spheres, granular, like granules of sand, what deformation will that sphere experience? So think about it. Because it's to start with, it's 10 to minus 4 or 10 to minus 3 millimeters, and its weight is grams. So by how much should that body deform so that the force that is produced sustain its weight? I think you agree with me that it's not a whole lot. Uh, but you need to capture that, because if you don't capture that, the very first layer would sink into the second layer. The second layer would sink into the third layer. So that's not what happens in the, in the real world. So let's look for a second how much the very first layer of spheres deforms under its own weight. And you know we start with the observation that if you have sand, like, like silica or quartz, the stiffness between two particles is of the order of 10 to the 10. And all these are SI units. And the density of the grain is 2,600 SI units again. Uh, you have to keep in mind that if you want to send something to Europa, the, gravi the, uh, the, the gravitational acceleration is 1.3. It's not 9.8 like on Earth. And the radius of this thing is 10 to minus 4. So if this is, these are the, the, the parameters that you work with, the deformation of a grain is 10 to minus 18. And just to put things in perspective, the, the, the distance between two atoms is about 10 to minus 10. Okay? So you are trying to capture deformations on the scale of 10 to minus 18 because that's the force that, that, that occurs at the interface to sustain the very first layer of particles pressing on the sand. Okay? Now, mind you, on Europa is 1.3, but there are people in France who are interested to send uh, a rover to Phobos and Deimos, which are the two moons of Mars. And on those two moons, the gravitational acceleration is actually 1,700 times lower than Earth. So it's way more than this. So this number is actually way less than this ballpark. So here is your tracking or attempting to track 10 to minus 18 deformation. So let me. Let me look now at how you go about it. So you want to track something on this scale. How many of you are familiar with computer programming and write code? OK, so take a look at this piece of code. It says like, hey, I have two variables, A, B, 
and here's the third one, C. And A is 0 0.2 and B is 0 0.1. So 0 plus 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1 is 0 0.3, right? So C is 0 0.15. So if I multiply C by 2, 0 0.15 times 2, it should be 0 0.3. So it means that if I subtract 2C from A plus B, the result should be 0. Do you agree? Do you buy that? So if you look, if you look at the value of ZZZ, oops, ZZZ on a computer is this. Okay? So ZZZ is not zero because you have finite precision arithmetic. There are 64 bits that you can use to store a number. So when you have this round of error and you do the math, just this simple operation incurs errors of the, on this scale. Yet you're trying on a computer to measure something that, that looks like this. So you don't have the precision required unless you start doing you know, other things, uh, relaxing, for instance, the value of the stiffness or increasing the, 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 the radius of the particle. Simply, you just cannot do something like this on a computer, again, unless you, 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 do, you take some additional steps to take care of business. So to make things even worse, um, usually when you look at the dynamics of a problem, what you do, you simulate and you look at snapshots of the motion of a system. Now, then a, your delta t time step later, and then later, and then later, and you just glue them together. And that's how you understand the time evolution of a system. Now the question is like, when you say later, what do you mean by later? It depends on what, what system you are looking at. For instance, if you look at like, like climate change, that step probably is like huge. But if you look at dynamics that happens like very quickly, and delta, delta <coughs> t, that time step should be very small. So how small is it for these problems? Because of the high frequency, because of that high stiffness, the dynamics is very really fast. So the time step that you have to deal with usually is kind of like 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 6 seconds. So you have to find, to look at the, look at one second of motion of the system, you have to take essentially 100,000 or 1 million snapshots of the system. Every single time you take a snapshot, you have to figure out the entire state of the system. So that's why these simulations are actually very compute intensive. So if you want to understand how compute intensive they are, we can take a look at the literature to see what is the size of the problems that people have been working with to understand how you know, difficult this is. So I'm listed here from 1998 to 2018, some papers, and these are good papers, like they're referenced a lot. And if you look at how many bodies these problems have, so it's like 4,000, 8,000, 1,000, hey, look, this is a guy, this is a guy from Harvard, 400,000, he's a hero. And then, you know, 20,000, 90,000, but ballpark, you get, you get the idea. They do not go beyond that because these are, they take a long time to simulate. So if you want to look at, okay, well, maybe people in the commercial sector do better. So this is a, a, a simulation software. By the way, I used to work for this company, which probably is going to explain the poor results that I'm going to report here. But... So imagine that you have this experiment where you settle granular material, okay? The granular material, it starts by being, I'm settling one sphere. I just drop a sphere, boom, in a, in a bucket. And then I drop two spheres, and then I'm going to drop four, and then eight, and 16, 32, and 64. And when I drop them, they start bouncing. So I'm going to look for three seconds how they bounce around, okay? So then I use this computer simulation to look at them moving for three seconds. And here is, how this problem scales. So if I look at, for instance, this was done first in 2008, and then in 2013, we had the same simulation package, a more recent edition of it. So in 2008, it took its scale like this. So if I wanted for 64 balls to look at like three seconds of dropping them in that box, it took about 3,000 seconds to understand how the balls moved for three seconds. So, and if, if this is how they scale, and I want to not look at 64, but I want to look at 1 million of them bouncing in that box for three seconds, it would be something like 25,000 years. 
So in this, in, in, in 2013, because you know things improved, it would only take something like 8,000 years. So I work out and I am careful what I eat. I, I, but still, I'm not going to eat that, live that long to see the end of the simulation. And this is one million. And I'm interested in one billion, if possible. And as you can, as you saw in the previous slide and see in this slide, then you know, we're not anywhere close to what we need. However, however, here come the Japanese, okay? So the largest simulation ever, <coughs> uh, not ever, let me put it this way, that I know of in this area is actually 2.4 billion bodies, okay? So how did they do that? So they used what in 2012 was the largest supercomputer in the world. It's called the K supercomputer. Uh, it's not the fastest anymore, uh, but they used 131,000 cores to solve this problem. So it was a big supercomputer, and they basically split the problem into small pieces, and they just solved it, and they produced something like, you know, the dynamics of 2.4 billion bodies. Um, now, mind you, I don't think anybody can afford something like this. Only to pay the bill for that, like the, the energy bill, that's a lot of money. Um, and to, so let's leave it there. So look at it as an opportunity. Okay, so can you do something about this? Um, now, before we talk about this opportunity, I have to tell you something about the problem we're trying to solve. If you have one body, and I, you try to understand how it moves, then what do you need? You need to understand where the body is, what the body velocity is, what the body's acceleration is, which is like six degrees of freedom, three, trans three translations and three rotations, position, velocity, acceleration, that's three times six, it's, X, it's, it's 18 variables. And then probably you have like mass and mass moment of inertia and stiffness and friction coefficient. So just ballpark, let's say that you have, for every body that you have, you have something like 25 numbers that you have to keep track so that you understand how this body, you know, the state of the body, how it changes in time. So if you have 25 numbers, a number on a computer requires eight bytes if it's stored in double precision, okay? 64 bits. So that means that if you have a body to deal with it, you need 0 0.2 kilobytes, okay? So now the problem is that you want to have billions of them, okay? So that's the, that's the challenge. So here is a thing that, that is super important and doesn't have to do anything with mechanical engineering, but has everything to do with computing. And this is very important, and it probably, it, it's very surprising, at least it was for me when I first learned about it. So it turns out that it's way more costly to move data than to compute, to carry out math. To be more specific, if you have a, what is called the pipeline architecture, which all the computers have today that you know we purchase, it means that at every clock cycle, you can do a computation. And not any computation, you can do what is called the fused multiply add. So in, in, in fact, you can do two operations at each cycle. So now you might ask, what, what the heck does a cycle mean? Do you know when you purchase a processor, it tells you that it's like 2.5 gigahertz or one gigahertz or whatever? So it means that at each hertz, so to speak, you know, you, it's like each one nanosecond, you produce, you do two operations in one nanosecond. However, to bring the numbers from memory, if they're not in cache, it takes about 200 to 400 cycles. So you can do the math in one cycle, you have to wait 400 cycles for data to come to you. If it's not where it ought to be, which is again in registers slash cache. So then the question is like, in this case, like, okay, well, for a body, I have to move 0 0.2 kilobytes, so then it means that I'm in this business of moving data, a lot of it. So that's going to by far dominate the entire conversation <coughs> here, okay? So not only that is significantly slower to move it, but also it's way more expensive from a power expenditure point of view to push data through a pipe to the bus. Math is very cheap, time-wise and power-wise. Um, so, here is another slide, doesn't have to do anything with mechanical engineering, but it's important when you start looking at very large problems. It turns out because of data movement issues, 
that bandwidth matter. So now, how many of you here, how many of you are playing computer games? Video games, not on your phone. Not on your phone. That's, that doesn't count. Do you know, how many of you have heard of a GPU card? NVIDIA, does this name tell you something? So this is like a GPU card that back in the day was for, for making Mario and uh, Grand Theft Auto run fast and look really cool. But it turns out that now it's, it's used heavily for, for scientific computing, okay? So imagine this, this, is, this is one node on a supercomputer. So on, on that node, you have, you have a, a, a CPU that might have 2, 4, 6, 8, 16, it goes all the way to 48 and beyond that cores. But in between these two cores, you have, and the system memory, you have pipes that, that data moves through. And these pipes have a bandwidth associated with it. And here, what I have in black here, the width tells you how, how wide that pipe is and how much data it can be pumped through. So it turns out that if you're in a supercomputer and you send data out of your node to a different node, the bandwidth is something like one gigabyte per second. One gigabyte. If you move data inside the GPU, the bandwidth is 900 gigabytes per second. So it's almost a thousand times faster if you move data on the GPU as opposed to if you move data on the K supercomputer. Okay, so it makes sense if you can solve the problem on the GPU to do so because the bandwidth looks really good. And then you have bandwidth somewhere in between the bandwidth that your CPU uses to talk to the system memory. We know when you buy a laptop and you say like, hey, my laptop is 16 gigabytes or 32 gigabytes or 64 gigabytes of memory, that's what you're talking about. The CPU talks with that memory over a bus that allows you to move data probably something like 80 gigabytes per second. If you move the data between the CPU and the GPU card, between Intel and NVIDIA, then that PCI Express bus usually is something like 16 gigabytes. So it's good to know these numbers because they will tell you which way to go if your problem is like, like really large. Okay, so with that, that's, that computer science tangent, you know, closed, let's, just give another perspective now of two things that come into play when we deal with data. So think about this problem of, I ask you, can you go to an orchard and, and bring an apple? So then what matters to me is like how fast you run to the orchard, come back with my apple. Or, and that's, that's called latency. Or I can tell you, please go to the orchard and bring me half of the apples in the orchard. And in that case, probably you're going to engage, you know, to, you're going to, to recruit some, I don't know, tractors or trucks or whatever, because there's a lot of apples. And it's just a matter of like bandwidth at that point. The, the latency is not that important anymore. It's bandwidth that matters, okay? So it depends what you want. If you want one piece of information, latency is king. If you want trucks and trucks, then bandwidth is, is king. So with that in mind, here is the, 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 the time that you have to wait for your data to come to you. <coughs> if you have data in what is called registers, that's as fast as you can think of, then is, is basically picoseconds. If you have level one cache, as it says here, probably is one nanosecond. If you have level two cache, which is four times more, but is further away, then you're going to have to wait probably like 10 times longer, 10 nanoseconds. If you have in, 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 the, in the level three cache, which is yet bigger, then you're going to have to wait 20 nanoseconds for the data. And if you have the data in your, in your RAM, 32 gigabytes, then you're going to have to run, wait 100 nanoseconds. So this is the game that you're, 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 you're playing here. Now remember, we said that for each body, you need 0 0.2 kilobytes to store it. So then where can you fit it? So if you, only have 320 bodies, then you can fit it in level one cache super fast, a nanosecond latency. If you have 1,200, well, you can fit it in here. If you have 12,000 bodies, you can fit it in here. And if you have like 50 million bodies, you can fit it in here, okay? 
But at this point, if you, speak, you start talking about this, it's not the latency anymore that is king because it's too much data. So what becomes important is the bandwidth. So the bandwidth is something like 80 gigabytes per second to move that, okay? Well, if you move this much data at this bandwidth, to move it, it takes 0 0.125 seconds to move it this way. So now if you move it back, once you do the, so I need to do computation. I bring data, I compute something, and I send the result back. So I need 0 0.125 this way and 0 0.125 that way, which means 0 0.25 seconds. Now remember, you do this every snapshot of the simulation, and I told you that to do one second of dynamics to see how the things move, you have to take something like 100,000 to 1 million times that. So you have to multiply 0 0.25 seconds times a million to figure out how long it will take you to run this simulation. That's a lot of time. And that's what explains why people do not go to millions of bodies. They stay with 3,000 bodies or 6,000 bodies or so. So the interesting thing is that you can replace these 80 gigabytes with 900 gigabytes. So you can cut the simulation by a factor of more than 10 if you move it to the GPU. So the GPU is great up to a point because unfortunately you can only have today kind of like 32 gigabytes, which means that you can still store in that memory if 0 0.2 kilobytes is what a body takes, ballpark you can store, you can store 100 million bodies on a GPU card that is used for video gaming, okay? So if you do something like that, you know, you can run a simulation like this, and I'll show you some other simulations, and this is the most boring one, but is the replica, <coughs> do you remember that bucket and dropping balls in the bucket one and two and four and eight? Here we drop 201 million bodies in the bucket, and this is the bucket. And you don't see the bodies because there are too many of them, but uh, this is what this simulation is. And for, remember, I told you that for one million body with that commercial software, it would take 8,000 years. So for 201 million, now it took about 24 hours instead of 8,000 years to do 2.8 seconds, so basically three seconds. So that's what happens if you start paying attention to where the data is and how you can move it, move it around. So I told you two slides ago that you can do 100 million. And now here I tell you that, hey, I just did 200 million. So how the heck did that happen? So the way that happened is that, and I'm not going to get into details, but rather than using eight bytes to store information, which is double precision, I stored, I used only four bytes to store each piece of information. And now you might ask yourself how you do that. That's a different topic for a different day. But, but, but long story short, if you now are shrewd about like how much bits you use to move this data back and forth, you can get the problem even, even larger. Um, now, how about like, can you go beyond 200 million? And the largest simulation that we run it's somewhere in the vicinity of 700 million. And how do you do that? For instance, all the spheres are the same. So then I don't have to store every single one what the mass is or what the mass moment of inertia is and such. All the stiffness are the same. So I store less and less information. I move back and forth less and less information. So the problem can get larger and larger. So up, up to this <coughs> point, the larger one that we ran on one GPU is as I said, 700 million uh, bodies. And here I have a, a plot that, that what we did, we took probably like one, two, three, four, five, five GPU cards from 500 bucks to 9,000 bucks. And we look at how fast and how far you can go. And what we did, we, we, we started the simulation with 50 million, 100 million, 150 million, and here, this is the time how long it took for a simulation to complete, and this is hours. So for one second, for like 300 million bodies, it took basically kind of like a day on, the, on this particular GPU, which is a Tesla V100 uh, GPU. But that's, that's the idea. And here, you know, here you see something like linear, and all of a sudden it goes up. What that means is that the GPU ran out of memory 
and now it starts paging data in and now it starts moving data on the CPU, bringing it to the GPU, CPU, GPU, and just like at that point, the entire thing falls apart. Um, how much does this cost? Uh, so if you have something like, like, like 300 million bodies, already you have more than 1 billion degrees of freedom. And you can do that for less than $10,000. So if you think about it, it's not 2.4 billion bodies. It's more like probably like 300, perhaps up to 700 million. But nonetheless, you don't have to purchase something that is probably in the vicinity of like $60 million. You can do with $10,000, you can start coming fairly close to the, to the supercomputer that these people used in Japan. Now, I told you that the important thing here is, is bandwidth and latency. And just out of curiosity, I have on this slide, I don't know if you can see it, but this, this is basically uh, a plot that shows some supercomputers like IBM and Cray, and this is the, the K supercomputer right here. And in terms of like what bandwidth it, it has, remember the GPU has 900 gigabytes per second. This, the bandwidth is something like 4.5, 4.4, so GPU 900, this guy 4.4. So it's going to be a lot of time that this supercomputer takes to solve the problem because the, the bandwidth at which it moves data around is, is actually very low. Um, okay, very quickly. Uh, are there any other ways to solve this problem without looking at deformations on the scale of like, you know, if you have two bodies, the deformation here is 10 to minus 10 to minus 17. Can you say like, hey, how about like, I just say that there's no deformation whatsoever. And I consider these bodies to be rigid. And if you do something like this, there's another approach. And what we discussed thus far is like, you know, this is our problem <coughs> and it's this branch. But you can do and solve it in a different way. You have like this body, these two bodies in contact and you formulate, you say like, hey, thing one and thing two, Dr. Seuss, they're not dead. They're like, you know, I'm going to come up with a different number one and number two. And I'm not going to get into details, but there are some ways to formulate this is number this is number one and this is number two. And this is looks ugly, but it says like mass times acceleration equals the sum of forces. And there is some friction and contact forces that comes from here and feeds into this equation. But at the end of the day, you have this equation and you use some applied math, you discretize in time. You have a problem here that is in the discrete domain now, it's not in the time domain anymore. And you solve it. And basically, it turns out that to find a solution, you have to solve an optimization problem. And that optimization problem, the solution of that optimization problem gives you exactly the normal and friction force. So how big is this optimization problem? And why, why do we bother with the first approach if we have a second approach that doesn't look at like 10 to minus 18 and such? So the problem, it turns out that you have to solve this optimization problem, minimize a quadratic cost function subject to, to, to conic constraints. Conic constraints, how many of you have heard of the friction curve? Okay, so it, it's, it ties back to that. So you have to optimize, to find a code minimum of a cost function. Now the interesting thing, and why this is the reason why this is not that commonly used, is that this optimization problem is super large. So, for instance, if you have a million bodies, a million bodies, then you have probably like four million contacts, ballpark. Each contact, for each contact, you have to solve, to find the normal force, a number, and the friction force, which is two numbers in the friction plane. So for every single contact event, you have to find three numbers. If you have four million of them, it means that four times three is 12 million variables. So imagine that you have a function, f of x, and that x is x1, x2, x3, all the way to x12 million. So you have a cost function that depends on 12 million variables, and you try to find the minimum of that function. And you have to solve this again at each time step. So this doesn't work very well when the problem is large, but it works very well in robotics, for instance, where the size of the problem is like probably like 200. So you have a cost function that depends on your 200 variables, and you try to minimize it. It's more digestible. But anyway, if you solve it, uh, you get the friction and contact forces. Once you have the forces, you do numerical integration, you get your velocity, you have your velocity, you do time integration, you get your positions, and you solve your problem. 
So I stop here with the math. I like this quote. Look at this. We hate math. Say four in ten, a majority of Americans. Uh, so let's move on. So this is a more interesting simulation. We have like one million bodies, and this is gravity material in a box. And you take the box and you shake it like this. And you have like, you know, a front wave propagating. So this is done on the GPU card, and it uses this other approach where you don't look at the deformation of every single body. Uh, this is an extrusion problem where you have a lot of cohesion forces between, between particles, and then, you know, you can simulate something like, you know, extrusion. Uh, and again, this is a discrete problem. You have like a lot of bodies that make up this, this simulation. Uh, here is, oh, let me see. I, uh, give me one second because I want to show you this. So this is uh, a 3D printing problem, and I I brought this along so that you can look at this material. So uh, if if can you pass it around? So the question is, here, here was the problem. The problem was how many? Uh, and do you remember? Tim Oswald? Yeah. Yes. So he's a professor in the department. And uh, he has a daughter, and she's into design clothes and design and such. And she wanted to 3D print a dress. OK? So now the question is, the, how do you 3D print a dress? Think about it. It's like, you know, a closed thing. And the printing area is like, these, like, let's say 10 inches by 10 inches by 10 inches. So now you have, like, a pile of material that looks like this, okay? So how do you 3D print this? That's, that's the question, okay? So here is, by the way, uh, this is part of the dress. And this is this I plan to wear for the weekend. That's, that's my that's the joke of the... Uh, and nothing else. No. Uh, so, uh, so... And by the way, you know, uh, in medicine, by law, we have to wear like red clothing, not like you here, like, you know, faculty. We have to wear like a red hoodie that says University of Wisconsin Medicine. No. Okay, so here is the simulation. So basically what, what you do, you take the dress, you generate the model in, 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 in uh, SOLIDWORKS, for instance, okay? And you have the dress, it's a computer model. And you have like this chain mail, right? So then you take, imagine that you take the dress and you shove it into that box virtually, right? So now you know where every single part of that dress is. I just look at it, it's like right, right here. It's like a part is here, another part is here, another part is here. But I know where every single ring of that dress is. So then I'm going to send back to the printer the information about every, where every single ring is. And then I'm going to 3D print, and then when you take it out, it's a dress, OK? So that's basically the, the gist of it. Now the question is, so here you have a problem where you have a big thing that you need to fit into a small thing in 3D print. But then there is the opposite of this problem, where you have many small things that you want to 3D print in a bigger thing, OK? So imagine that you have, again, the 10 by 10 by 10. But I have like, imagine I have small napkins and I want to 3D print them. I can 3D print one, but it would be a waste. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take like a bunch of napkins, not napkins, napkins, but something of that material, and I'm just going to drop them there. And I'm going to figure out where every single one of them stopped. And I'm going to take that information, send it back to the printer. And the printer is going to 3D print. And then when I get them out, they're like disconnected and they're like the, the size that I care about. Does it make sense? So that's the opposite of the problem of the previous slide, where it was like something big and something small. This is now something small into something big. Anyway, so that's that. Um, so how is this done? You should tell me when I have to stop, because I just keep talking on and Five, on and minutes. on. Five minutes? OK, I have to tell you something. I'm a slide 58, and I have about one in 30 slides. <laughs> so we're not going to leave. The, door, the doors have been locked. So I have to probably rush. Um, anyway, so I told you, you remember those Italian guys? They started this piece of software, and this is done with that software. So what we do in the lab, we, we write software that, that does this kind of stuff. So 
At this point, uh, this is doing or solving problems from multi biodynamics, like rigid biodynamics, flexible biodynamics, fluid solid interaction. Um, and it's, it's available. How many of you have heard of GitHub? It's open source and you can download it and use it. Um, and uh, they are like probably like half a million lines of code and it's in C++. And because it's in C++, it's modular and you can extend it and it runs on Linux and Windows and Mac and it runs on processors such as, you know, x86 architecture for Intel or PowerPC of IBM or, or the ARM <coughs> architecture. So it, it, it's a, it's a, I don't want to say it's a professional piece of code, but still it, it, it's, it's, it's pretty nifty. And it has a certain structure, which I'm going to skip because I'm running out of time. Uh, but it can do all sorts of things such as, for instance, vehicle dynamics or like granular dynamic simulation and, and, and so on. And I'm going to show you a couple of simulations. Um, yeah, okay, probably this is worth saying this. So this piece of software was adopted by the army to simulate their, to design their vehicles and to do what is called the vehicle dynamics engine. And this is basically how a chunk of the money that, that feeds us comes to the lab. And it's owing to the fact that the army adopted the, the, the software. So uh, there was a series of benchmark tests, one for wheeled vehicles, one for tracked vehicles. And I'm going to show you some simulations that some of them are tied to that. But a lot of it has to do with like mobility on deformable terrains and such. So if you remove that wheel and you look at the terrain, I don't know how many of you have heard the bulldozing force. It's like this front where the, the because of your weight, the, 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 the ground <coughs> rises in front of the wheel as it moves, and it's this red. So blue is, is sinking, red is, is lifting. And it's like you, as you move, you keep seeing terrain rising in front of, of, of the wheel. And these are like, if you look at this, this is the deformation front for the wheel for three cases. Uh, when you have negative slip, zero slip, and positive slip, negative slip in the extreme is like, imagine if you have the wheels of a cart locked, and you drag that cart on, a, on, on the beach on, in, in sand. And like positive slip, uh, if you push it to the extreme, imagine if you have the same cart, and all of a sudden the wheel starts spinning like really fast in place, and basically you don't move fast, uh, you don't move forward, but they spin a lot. And zero slip is when it moves, forward as fast as the wheels turn, basically. And with each regime, you have different deformations of the soil and different resistive forces as you move the, the vehicle. And this is like a, this is a simulation of a nonlinear tire uh, made of rubber. This is probably like, you know, when you put it all together, uh, a simulation of a vehicle that moves over an obstacle on deformable terrain. And probably this is one of the, the, the longest simulations uh, that we ran. And just uh, to give you an idea about this was run, we split this problem into six parts. So a tire was on one computer, another tire on a different computer, four tires, four computers. The granular material was a fifth computer and the body of the vehicle, the chassis and the subsystems were a sixth computer. So they worked together to solve, to solve this problem. This is getting into multi-physics because now if you're interested in fording, you have to, to for a problem like this, you have to start looking at what is called the Navier-Stokes equations of motion for, for fluid. And uh, at this point, probably I am about to run out of time. But uh, you know, in addition to those equations I showed you about 20 slides ago, this is a set of Navier-Stokes equations. This is the equation of continuity for the flow of the fluid. And we discretize this in space we're using a so-called smoothly particle hydrodynamics method. And you have all sorts of like, you know, ways of solving this. Uh, it's just like methods that are good at, you know, at the particular set of, set of applications. Um, and for instance, this is like a combination in which you look at the flow of a fluid through a maze of deformable bodies and arresting the motion of like, let me show you the picture here. So this is a snapshot. And if you remove the fluid, you have these rigid bodies. If you remove those, you see the maze of deformable bodies. So when I say multi-physics, this is what I mean. I mean like the fluid 
moving over these bodies are flexible and you have rigid bodies. So these equations of motion, they are completely different, but they are solving the same framework to produce a solution. And, you know, just to give you an idea about like how long it takes to solve something like this, for 20 seconds long of the dynamics of this vehicle, it took about 59 hours using 40, 40 processors to, to, to solve the problem. Uh, and I like this quote because I showed you a bunch of movies, you know, and the question is like, do they mean anything? And are the results anywhere close to what happens in reality? I like this quote of Yogi Berra, who said that in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. Uh, or I like this one, you know, simulation is doomed to succeed. You always get some numbers. So you, success is guaranteed, you know. The question is like, do they mean anything? And anyway, I have like probably like 30 slides or so that, you know, I go through all sorts of like validation cases and uh, just to, to, to show you how close the results are to what happens in reality. This is an hourglass, for instance. And this is a very simple test. You have like granular material and hourglass just flows. And you should see like a constant flow rate. Uh, and we look at, we have the device and measure that and we simulate that. And then we look at like impact, and you have a ball that hits ground and it makes a crater, and a simulation like that, and you know, all sorts of other simulations like cone penetration and and uh, shock wave propagation. So imagine that you have like a like a projectile hitting a, a hitting granular material, and the question is. How is the shock wave propagating to that granular material? And this is a, a, a simulation of, of that. And yeah, basically, that's basically it. Sorry, but I don't. I ran out of time. Uh, but I understand that we have some more time, and if you stick around, I can show you more stuff. Um, I don't know if we run out of time for questions, or do, do you have any questions about this stuff? Right, yes. Yeah. 